right. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to another beautiful day here at the gathering in the gathering room one more time. Um, it's exciting. I love these little services, and if the sound sounds a little different, we don't have the full sound system on for you guys online. But let's worship God today by singing some songs that uh, um, that probably a lot of you know. We're not going to do too many of them today, but they're good songs to go along with the sermon. Uh, let's pray, and we'll get started today. Dear Holy Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we could be here and worship you. I thank you for the opportunity to come together on a holiday weekend and just rest. I pray that everyone's weekend is restful, that all the stress of the world melt away for just, just a little bit as we worship you. I uh, pray deeply uh, that over this service you will reign, that you will show up in a big way in the gathering today, and that we might learn exactly what you have us to say that the world might melt away around us so we could focus on praising you. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For he is good, he is above all things. Forever God 
We're only going to start with two songs today. It felt like a good week to kind of shorten the service a little bit, have a little intimate time in here. I do like standing a lot more. I sat a little bit last week, but I don't, I don't think I sing as well. I can't open up my diaphragm as much, so. And that is a mom quote directly. <laughs> um, from, not from last week, but from a while ago. She just, uh, I don't like it as much when I sit. But, so you get a little bit of a different angle this week, especially online, but you guys are too. Um, now we enter the time in our service where we get to do our prayer and praises. Does anyone have a prayer or praise this week? Of course, Carson dancing along to my <laughs> songs was very awesome. Quite like that. Apparently, he prays when I, I want to. I was just going to joke. Um, apparently, he uh, gets a little upset when I'm done singing. So. Well, there you go. Well, there you are. <laughs> That's what it was. Yes, yeah, exactly what it was. Yes. Sure. Uh, I have another great grandbaby. Oh, awesome. Had, she came uh, the third. What was that? Yesterday, day yeah, two days, two days ago. I think it's fifth today, but Her close. Name's Violet. Violet, that's super cute. Oh, that is sweet. And then I love that. The other friends that I had, you know, the one in Texas passed away, mm -hmm. and then actually last Sunday, um, the uh, the one in Michigan passed away too. So we lost both of them. Uh, blessing and a uh, prayer request this week. Mm -hmm. That's uh, that's rough. We will be praying mm -hmm. for the family. That's always hard. Anyone else today? And pray for Pastor Tim's travels. Yep, of course. Mm -hmm. Pastor Tim's on a well-deserved vacation, coming back this next week. Mm -hmm. So that'll be fun. I'm sure he wants to stay a little bit longer. But I don't know. <laughs> he probably misses us. I bet you he does. <laughs> if he doesn't... We're just going to make it up to him. You, but, we're going to believe it. Yeah, we're going to believe it. <laughs> probably having a good time, though. Just making fun of him. Um, anyone else today? Of course, a uh, good holiday weekend. Let's pray that it's restful. Uh, we it seems like we need it. I need it. I don't know about you guys, but I need some time out of the campground on Monday. I really do. I'm very excited about that, to be honest with you. Prayers that uh, um, Ashley's pregnancy keeps going well, going super well, super well. We are blessed beyond reason, but just continue prayers because I'm sure the prayers have something to do with why nothing's gone wrong. Right. So I'm very uh, like really nothing. <laughs> I was thinking about it. Nothing. So he's kicking now. This kicked really hard. <laughs> so let's continue prayer for that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the ability to just come into your presence and talk to you like you're sitting in the room with us because that's exactly what you're doing. I uh, I pray for a couple of situations in Shirley's life, a couple of friends that passed away recently. I pray for the families, and I just pray for everyone involved. It's so tough to lose love. But at the same time, you brought life back into the world, too, with another great uh, granddaughter. Bo both we pray for the family, but we also just praise you for new life that you're creating at all times. That you are God and you continue to work in this world in some amazing, amazing ways. Uh, I'd like to lift up Carson today, that he continues to grow up healthy and that our pregnancy goes well as well. I'm just babies in the church, and it's so beautiful to see. I uh, pray uh, for Pastor Tim as he travels back, safe travels, um, and that he comes back all ready and rested to go. And I just pray for the service, that we might open our hearts to you, that we might be welcome to you telling us things, and that my words may be yours and not my own today. I pray that uh, if I say anything wrong, you might just strike it from everyone's memory that you alone can have a good message come out today. Praise the things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, we'll dive right into it. Uh, we'll be in Psalm 136 for those who want to turn to it. There's a few Bibles sitting around. If you would like to, good little thing to turn to. Dead center Bible, pretty much. Uh, when we've been going through Psalms, We've had a lot of, uh, Pastor Tim went through and picked out a lot of popular ones, so did I, I helped him do it. And uh, we came up with a lot of ones that we are very familiar with. Um, like last week I got to preach on, he, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Super common um, Bible scripture because it has so much meaning in it. But this week I'm going to do one that probably you guys haven't read before. Of course, you've heard, if you've heard of the song forever, you've heard it in some way because um, this is kind of that idea in forever, but 
probably haven't read this scripture. It's because it's not necessarily one that catches your eye. And it's because it repeats itself so often. So I could have picked any of the verse sections of this, but I'm just going to do one through, uh, uh, what is it, one through four? Yes. Uh, Psalm 136. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. To him alone who does great wonders, his love endures forever. So, you'll realize something very quickly about this chapter. It repeats itself a lot. Um, there's one thing I really... When I study the Bible, I do. this is one of the big things I look for. Does the topic repeat itself? Because usually what it does, the Bible wants you to focus on it. Like, the Bible is full of good information that we should focus on, but be sure when you're reading your chapters or you're reading a chapter of the Bible, if it repeats a topic multiple times, be sure you're paying attention to it. Not only does this repeat multiple times, it repeats 26 times in a row. Every single verse, the second line of the verse, is his love endures forever. And the reason I've always wanted, I, I was kind of looking through the Psalms when I was studying one day, and I've always wanted to do a sermon about this chapter, because I just think not enough people know it exists. And it comes into one of the most incredible topics in the Bible uh, that we barely understand, that us as humans, are, our minds can't grasp the complexities of just one short little line of his love endures forever. And I'm going to kind of explain why and try to explain the different words in that sentence as much as I can. Um, again, this week's going to be a week of me struggling to find words to explain really, really complex topics. So if I stammer around a little bit, that's why I'm trying to paint a picture of something that I don't even totally understand. And you'll see what I'm talking about in a few minutes. I feel like I have some good examples and some things that we can come closer, but us as humans are incapable of understanding some things that God does. He's bigger than us. He's more powerful than us. Which leads us directly into what we have to accept before we go into the study. What truths are in the Bible that we need to get in our head before we can start moving forward with this certain topic? And to be honest, it's the same as last week's. God is amazing. I, I spent some time on that in the intro last week because the Psalms like to really focus on it, right? So we go through and we see David saying, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. Give thanks to the God of gods. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. We see a topic here of him praising God for creating the heavens. You go later in the chapter. Who made the great lights, the sun to the governor of the day, the moon to the start of the governor of the night. Him who uh, struck down the firstborn out of Egypt. You go even later in the chapter. He remembered us in our low states. He freed us from our enemies. He gives food to every creature. You see David building this idea of God that is amazing. We talked a little bit about last week. We serve a God who is all-knowing, who is all-powerful, who is everywhere at once. And to really understand this chapter, we have to understand that God knows significantly more than us. Once we can accept that fact, once we know how powerful he is, how ridiculously cool what he does is, we can kind of start to understand the chapter a little bit better. And we can actually enter studying what he means by his love endures forever. Because if we don't trust God in those ways, if we don't think his ways are higher than ours, if we don't grasp his power, we will not understand this message. This message will be total nonsense. But if we do, we start to see definitions of words defined by God rather than by humans. And God's definition, trust me, is better than ours. So, First of all, I want to dive into the concept of forever. Um, a concept that we talk about constantly in Christianity. This is a topic we like to dive into. We talk about eternity in heaven. We talk about eternal life. We, talk, we use this word a lot. Uh, for, and by the way, I'll talk more about eternity as a word because it's easier to describe in scripture than forever, even though they have the exact same meaning. Um, when I say eternity, I mean forever. It's just 
um, the verses tend to use eternity more than they use forever. But exactly the same definition, they're synonyms, they can be used interchangeably. But we like to talk about eternity a lot. But do we even slightly grasp it? I would argue no. Um, we say it so much, and this is a problem with, it's, I struggle with this as well. It's a problem with Christianity, but I struggle with it hard. When I see something repeated or I talk about it a lot, I sometimes tend to gloss over it when I'm reading about it. Oh, his love endures forever. Cool, I've heard that before. Let's move on. Like, we've seen that song a million times in church before in my lifetime. Basically, once a month since 2001, right? When it was written. So, like, we tend, like, it's an easily gloss overable statement. But it's so amazing because it's just impossible to comprehend. Like, um, I can't give you words to 100% encapsulate this idea. I can't. The greatest I can do is give you some examples that get us closer. Give you some analogies that kind of help us to understand the concept of a very long period of time. One is uh, uh, the rope idea. Like, it's a very, and I would have showed a video, but I actually didn't even have it first, so I'll explain it to you. Francis Chan had a really cool sermon illustration back in the day, and I couldn't find my rope or I'd be doing this for you in here. Um, because Dad made me one first or second sermon <laughs> I was doing, and I used this example. But he brought out an extremely long rope that reached to the back of his sanctuary that kind of looped around the corner. Um, and he said, this is eternity. You can't see the end. It just keeps going. This extremely long rope. And he had a little piece of red tape, maybe about that big, at the end of this 60, 70, 80 foot rope. That's shorter than I expected. Sorry. It's much more than a 100 foot long rope that he had. 80 feet is not that long. But he had it reaching out the back of his sanctuary. He had about probably two inches of tape. And he was saying, we think that 100 years on Earth is a long period of time. We just, uh, we were celebrating, well, uh, Jan was very happy someone was having their 99th birthday today. It is a long time on Earth. But it's just a sliver comparative to the eternity we're going to, like, th that eternity exists. Like, we're going to live forever in one way or another. Well, whether it's in heaven or hell, where, wherever we go, we have an eternal life, right? Whether it's good or not is a different story. But he was trying to take this concept of this tiny little piece being where we got married, and where we had kids. Uh, this is where I tried out for the football team and didn't make it. And he's just making all these little things. Like, this is the life that we live comparative to the entirety of the rest of eternity. Right? It doesn't even pale. It pales in comparison to what eternity actually looks like. Another one, um, it was uh, the Teelys that came to like, I think it was my third sermon I ever did. And I, I mentioned eternity. And I was talking about how incredible it is, kind of like this. And uh, they gave me an example of eternity that I'll never forget. Um, and here would be, if I was using the slides, a picture of Mount Everest. Just gigantic mountain. Like, it is one of the most challenging things in the world to climb. It is just amazing how big the scope of Mount Everest is. Um, and they gave me this, um, the concept of eternity is like a bird flying up to the top of Mount Everest, sharp at its beak so it can get into the nuts it needed to. You know, they rub their beaks up against stuff, sharp it a little bit so they can get into stuff. Every time that takes a lit, just a little bit of a few pebbles off of the top of Mount Everest, right? And the birds keep coming back every day doing the same thing. Eternity is longer that it would take that bird to completely reduce Mount Everest to pebbles. It is longer than that. So when you start, you see the scope, like the scope of eternity is more than I could possibly understand. I could never imagine a bird being able to scrape down the entirety of Mount Everest to nothing. But at the same time, if given eternity, that would probably happen. Just when we talk about eternity, it's such a insanely huge concept. But, uh, but that brings me to my second definition. And we'll tie, this, we'll tie these two together at the end. The second definition is what is love? 
What is the definition of love? Yeah, I, there's a reason I didn't do the, uh, the slide like that, because the slide says definition of not love and not what is love, because I was making a joke to myself the entire morning. But I would usually bring up a dictionary definition right now. I love dictionary definitions, and I think that usually it leads you, it starts to lead you in the right direction of a concept. When I'm talking about what something is, I want to get as close as I can to it and then explain what the Bible says. But when I looked up what is love, there were seven different definitions and none of them even came close to what I was trying to say. You know why? Because I will argue today, human beings are so bad at loving on our own. We are not good. <laughs> and to be honest, like, I saw a few shocked faces in first service, but then they started thinking about like all that the world has to offer right now, all that's going on, and you start to realize, yeah, that's right. Human beings are great at it. There are some that do well. There's some that don't. At there's times in history that are good. There are times that are bad. Right now, I wouldn't say that we're really, really good in America at loving each other. It's not a common practice right now. Even though, if you ask most humans, they'd say, oh, yeah, I'm a loving person. But when the mass majority don't really show that, do they? Like, I struggle with that same thing. Like, uh, I struggle with loving people all the time. I'm sure you guys do too. Like, it is a common thing that when someone hurts us, when someone goes after us, when drama happens, that we start, we stop loving quite often. And... So all these human definitions do not add up. So I went to the Bible, trying to find what the definition of the Bible was, and I'd love to have a sentence for you that completely encapsulated what love is in the Bible. I'd love to have a very direct definition. But what I found was there isn't one. There isn't a sentence, there are three words to describe what love is. Three words that are short, but yet that really take on a life of their own. God is love, and love is God. We have this idea of if we want the definition of love, that can't exist without God, right? So um, a quick little verse in John 4, 7 through 12, 1 John 4, 7 through 12. Great verses, great chapter. But dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son for the atoning sacrifice of our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. Uh, no one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. It's a really repeaty message because it's trying to make you see something. It's just like his love endures forever, his love endures forever, his love endures forever. This verse is very similar in the way of God is love, God is love. We don't love without God. God is love. They want us to see that the definition, the closer we get to understanding God and his character and what he did for us, the more we will understand what love is. Because if we follow what God did, what God said, what God commanded, no matter what, we'll be loving. We could not even be thinking about loving other people. And then we follow what God says and we'd end up loving everyone around us. If we follow what God says, we will end up at love because that's who he is. Right? That's what he does. Everything he does is out of love. Whether that be some of the harsher things with tough love or whether that be some of the gracious things by sending his son. God is love, and that's the only definition we can really run by, isn't it? Because everything else falls short. And... If you bring these two concepts together, uh, when you take the concept of eternity and you take the concept of love, 
and you bring them together, what does that mean for us? Like I gave you some definitions, but if you bring it together and you really focus on his love endures forever, what does that actually mean for our lives? First of all, I want to argue it is not possible to love others without God. Not in a way that actually is love. There's so much relationship turmoil in this world right now. Divorce rate's super high. Um, broken homes, super high. Family turmoil, super high. It, and a lot of the symptoms we have in this world is because a lot of people love or try to love with their own definition of that word. And I will tell you one thing, humans love always ends eventually. It always has a stopping point, it always has a ceiling. When we do things on our own, there is always a point of no return, a point where that love stops and um, we start not loving a person. Um, I, can't, I can't tell you very many times where I haven't seen it at least once in a person where they finally hit their wall. Which, we're always going to have trouble with it. We're never going to be exemplify God's love exactly. So we're always going to struggle with the fact of loving people that hurt us. It's just, a, it's human nature. Until Jesus comes again, we will always be struggling with that. But... Let me tell you, when we love with the love of God, rather than our definition of it, when we start to follow God's commands, when we start to read his word, when we start to spend time with him, and really like start trying to channel his love through us, we love deeper than we could possibly imagine. That love does not end. Right? When our love falls short, the love of Jesus goes before us. The love of God goes before us, because his cannot possibly end at all. So if we are channeling that love, it can't end. If we are in tune with God, our love will be so much stronger than if we took our own definition for it. Because honestly, we can't love people right without him. Right? Because if we don't know God, that love is not real. That's why we get married under God. That's why we dedicate our children to God, because that love is so much stronger when we have God with us. We can love our families better. We can love our spouses better. We can love our people better. We can love random people off the street better because that love of God is so much stronger than we could possibly imagine it being. And the last point for today I'll make and this is the real so what of the sermon that I want you to get out of it today. I, have been, I, I haven't been in the ministry for as long as a lot of pastors have. Don't get me wrong. There's a lot of pastors who have been doing this for a lot longer than me. Pastor Tim's one of them. But I've been doing it for about 10 years now. It's, no, it's, it's a good little chunk, I would say. And I've seen a lot of people in churches. Worked at a lot of churches, saw a lot of volunteers. And I will caveat this by saying I am not in any way insulting the volunteer basis of our church because I love them and they do a great job. But this is more of a takeaway for our sermon. I have seen good volunteers and I've seen bad volunteers. I've seen the gambit. I've seen a lot in the middle. People leaning one way, leaning the other way. Good, really good, really bad in my years. I can tell you one thing that will constantly be at the top of my volunteer list. When you ask why people do it, sometimes the words don't come to people, right? Some can't explain why they do it. But if you really start talking to your best volunteers in the church, your best volunteers in any charity, and you get down to the core of why they do it, they will always be because God told me to. Right? It won't be because they like it. It won't be because they want to do it. Those are really, in the grand scheme of things, they're really weak reasons to do things. Because if we want to, our wants change. If we love doing it, our love changes. Our love has a stopping point. But when we do things because we know God would want us to, because God wants us to show his love in this way, nothing could possibly get in our way, nothing could stop us, that will never end. 
Because we can so much better love people if we're loving them through God. And I know it's a crazy concept, and I can't explain particularly how that works in your life, because I don't know. It's a very individual thing. To figure out how to show God's love through you is very individual. It's very based on, like, your relationship with him and how he talks to you, right? Because there's so many ways that he talks. I don't know what your specific one is. But I'm telling you, if we spend our time trying to figure out how God wants us to love, how God wants us to serve, how God wants us to serve others, in looking at how, how he acts in the Bible and trying to emulate that, our love will be so much stronger. The church will be so much stronger. The gathering won't be able to hold how many people will come into the zone. <laughs> because the love of God, when shown right, is some of the most coolest things I've ever seen. And it's completely unignorable. But, just like you guys, I struggle how to do it. So, what's my advice for that? Go home. Rekindle your love for God. If you, if you aren't great at studying, try for a few minutes today. If you aren't great at praying, try for a few minutes today. Try to get your relationship to a point with God to where we can start seeing how to love through him. In loving the world in a so much deeper way than we could possibly imagine. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you we could be here and worship you. And I thank you so much that you are not only willing to teach us your love, try to teach us concepts that we have a hard time understanding or even following, but that your love will never die with us. No matter how many times we mess this up, your love is there for us. But I also thank you that you gave us the power of your love. That not only can we be loved by you, but we can love like you. That your power and your love is so much more powerful than anything we can understand. But that we have it in our hearts today. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. See, this, this song is not exactly the most known of all songs, but I think it does really well to help us understand God's love. So if you know the song, feel free to sing along. If you don't, I understand. Um, we would usually have words for this, but we don't today. Man of sorrows, Lamb of God, by his own betray the sin of man and wrath of God has been on Jesus lay silent as he stood accused beaten mocked and scorned bowing to Precious blood that my
Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Whom the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. Oh, the rocket cross, my salvation. Where your love poured out over me. Now my soul cries out. The stone is rolled away. Behold the empty tomb. Well, thank you for attending the gathering today. Have a great long weekend. You know, I sent a...